until I get this All right. Up. Got it. Okay. I want to say good evening and welcome everyone to another episode of Adoption Happy Hour brought to you by NAP. We are the National Association of Adoptees and Parents where it is our mission to unify the adoption community and elevate our diverse voices by promoting dialogue, understanding and healing through education, awareness and connections. We're so glad to have each and every one of you uh, here joining us tonight. We know this is a busy time of the year and a lot of people are with their families and uh, have other commitments. So we appreciate you joining us this evening. Um, I know most of you have already gone ahead and dropped in the chat room where you're from. Let Jenny know where you're viewing this from. She would appreciate that greatly. Cool. Again, I'm Marcy Keithley, your host for the evening, along with Jennifer Falsing and Bess Sturry, both board members helping out in the Zoom room. And do we have any other board members this evening? Let's see who's with us. Uh, we have advisory members here. The yes. Here. Lorraine Dusky, you can give us a wave. She serves on our advisory committee. She's in New York. Okay, that's all we have right now. Welcome, welcome. Okay, we just wanted to, um, obviously here's our disclosure. Uh, everybody again, stay on mute. If you've got a question, raise your virtual hand. You're welcome to use the chat room for comments or questions. This is a public meeting with no guarantee that information or identity is confidential and portions of this event are recorded and shared on our YouTube channel. If you're experiencing um, a serious mental health event or suicidal thought, please contact a licensed professional or call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Thank you for that, Jennifer. Okay, so let's learn just a little bit about um, Jenny, also known as Cami. She is a singer, songwriter, guitarist, and pianist. Jenny Albert, her birth name was Cammie, is Cammie, was born in Los Angeles and adopted out of the foster care system at the age of four. Upon reuniting with her biological father, who was homeless, addicted, and running from the law at the time, yet a musician just like her, a documentary team made a short doc called Homeless, the soundtrack. So welcome, Jenny. Round of applause, round of applause. <laughs> Yay. I'm moving into as you share. It's so good to have you this evening and we're ready to learn all about you and hear your story. Cool, I just what, decided I wanted to move into the music room so the dogs don't disturb us. Cause I have lovely dogs. <laughs> all right. Think that'll be better than the outside. How's that for everybody? If I turn it like this, can you see okay? Does that work? Is that okay? Yes, that's good. Okay. Welcome to our music room. Okay. We are. All right. Well, I'll let you start because um I'm happy to be here. So you okay. tell me. Sure, sure. We just like to go ahead and just share a little bit of, about your personal story about, uh, you know, your, your personal adoption story and where you began when you began your search and how that went. Just, just tell us the story. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, well, let's see. Uh, I was adopted out of the foster care system when I was about four to my forever home. And so I always knew that I was adopted. I knew a little bit about my lineage and my storyline simply because there was a, a quite a hefty court case with lots of moving parts leading up to my final adoption. And I was old enough to kind of know things were happening, but not necessarily to articulate them clearly at first. Uh, but, but through the years, my, my adopted family, who I call mom and dad, were always very, you know, they were as open as they felt it was appropriate to be for my age group. And, um, and yeah, so they just sort of kind of informed me as time went on what, 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 what my story was to a point. Uh, and then when I was a freshman in college, 
I actually took this class, this Native American history literate, literature class that was really inspiring. And there was a story about a young girl who found her birth family. And I thought, I want to do that. Like I was always very curious. Um, and then I had a conversation with my mom about it. And she was like, you know, uh, I have to tell you. And I wanted to wait until you were a little bit older. But your birth mother recently passed away. And I'm, I'm so sad to tell you. You haven't had a chance to kind of you know, meet her, to learn more about her. And she was worried about that for me, um, which was very thoughtful, I felt. But there was a court case related to her passing as well. Um, and that was because my birth grandmother had an estate through um, Los Angeles connected to Denver. And I was written in the estate as a benefactor for whatever would happen after my birth mother passed away, which was very unusual back then because it wasn't like an open adoption. And so the two, uh, the two lawyers got together to fight for my rights, which I think opened a whole federal case, which, which then set the stage for allowing adoptees in the future to inherit um, if a birth family chose to write them in. It was a very unique situation. I, it wasn't so much a lot of inheritance as much. It was the idea and the point, which was very thoughtful that someone thought of me, that they continued to think of me for those who knew I existed. And, uh, and that was very touching. And so that then gave me a whole other packet of legal information that had lots of backstory of my foster care story, uh, my adoption, a little bit about my birth mother and her history and how she ended up where she ended up and how she ended up meeting my birth father and how he ended up being the, I call him the inventor of me. Uh, so, you know, there was that piece. Um, and so, so for the first, I'd say five to six years that I don't necessarily talk about too much for no reason other than that it was just a, a unique special time in and of itself. I had a lot of experiences meeting maternal birth relatives who were still living. Most of them were cousins or cousins of cousins. And that was fun and thrilling. And that also gave me a good six years of emotional preparation and intellectual preparation, aside from the fact that I was raised in a pretty stable environment that pushed education. And I think my, my wiring, my personal wiring in and of itself was pretty open and loving and non-critical or judgmental. I didn't feel like I was a thrown away kid really at all ever. So um, I just felt like an emptiness, like a, a sheet, a black sheep in a, in a space that didn't seem familiar. And I always felt like kind of an empty hole, something wasn't complete, but I never felt resentment or anger or anything like that. Um, but so the first three, six years of meeting my maternal birth cousins and learning that lineage was really fun and uh, light, you know, because it wasn't birth parents. And it was just a sort of it was an introduction to how you can engage with birth families. And it was an interesting uh, journey. But it wasn't until years after that, when I was struggling with relationships and really wanting to cultivate a family of my own or build like an intimate relationship with a partner and not really knowing how to do that or why it was so hard for me that I wondered like, well, who's my birth father and wh where does he come from and what's his lineage and is he even alive? And so uh, I got some help with a private investigator, like a friend basically, and said, you know, here's the court papers that I have. I've kind of always had them. I have a name. I don't really know much about him. And at the time I didn't know he was a musician. I didn't know he was homeless. I knew he had some uh, addiction uh, issues or relationship with drugs. And I knew that he had been in and out of like jails and prisons and stuff for the drug behavior. Um, but I didn't really know much more or even if he was alive. So that started the journey. Uh, it took, turns out that where I was living at the time, downtown LA, he was literally like six Metro stops away. And he was mostly choosing homelessness when not incarcerated for not being sober and following probation to get out of the system. He just kind of was always in the system really since he was nine or 10. So for him, it was too overwhelming and a burden to try to get out of the system. So he became involved with the system becoming part of his life. So he had a whole different perspective, a whole different take. I, 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 would, I would quantify him almost as like a savant. I feel like he was really like a 
almost maybe spectrum savant. He was so brilliant in so many ways with his chess playing and his musicianship and his mind mapping skills and his solution solving skills. And because I had worked so much as a volunteer in social services all through college, even before that working with those experiencing or choosing homelessness or creating a men's correctional facility program for transition for those in jails or working with foster youth just by choice doing these things and as well as being a musician myself, it really felt like I had this tool belt. Uh, and besides that, I was a very creative, independent, self-reliant sort of solution solving person myself. When I found Don, it was like instant connection. I loved him instantly. He loved me and it was really fun. So uh, that's, that's sort of the story I figured out. I found out he was still living, mostly um, choosing homelessness in the Long Beach area, if not downtown LA or in the commerce area. Uh, he had reasons for doing this and it was kind of brilliant, his way he, of survival. And he was used to it and he wasn't really doing um, all the hard drugs he used to do at that time. He was doing some. And so I just spent three weeks, I would call it undercover in the field, only identifying myself as my birth name, Cami, barely saying much about anything of my life and my music stuff at all at first, just to kind of observe who this person was from a distance and to get to know him. And I literally like took notes, did research, reconnaissance, all that. And it was very unusual. It was very different. I knew it was different from the get go. I didn't even tell anybody uh, that I was doing that. I even researched like the crime in the area and, you know, knew the police and everything. So I was like, literally like CSI Cami, and it was fun. It was fun. It was very, very thrilling and it was amazing. And every day I happened to have a lot of time on my hands. So every day, like I could spend hours in the, in the field with him doing different things, introducing him to different things, showing him different things, including him into different things, sitting and having conversation with him. We read children's books so I could get his processing and his cognitive skills. Um, I would, you know, put him in different situations and observe and see how he did. And he was just eating at the palm of my hands at any opportunity for something new. And that makes our story very unique and different um, because it's not just like a biological reunion story where you find your birth family. It's like a love story of, of, of a dichotomy where we basically found a, a common ground and helped each other and loved each other for five years through this unconditional experience. So I'm very thoughtful about anyone who's been adopted or you know, had to relinquish a child or is adopting, you know, there's so many moving parts and so many perspectives and so many different feelings and different stories. Everyone has their own. And I know for sure ours was so unique that the takeaway is more about offering thoughts on stigma or, you know, just perspective on approach um, and, and just thoughts on experience really, rather than it being like a similar Thing that anyone else has experienced but I'm so happy to be here and you can ask me any question you want otherwise I'll just talk forever and that's no good so <laughs> well we love it when you talk forever and I know we've got some some clips now we did give you um sharing privileges that uh because I don't know how much Jen can share Jen do you have anything downloaded I sent you guys the link for Dawn's take I don't know how to do zoom I I don't know how to share anything okay. So okay, whoever. now the Don's take on adoption and reunions, I can play that from the YouTube channel. It's 33 minutes. Do you want me to play the whole thing? Well, I, I think that if anyone wants, here's what I think. If anyone wants to ask me questions before we do the video, we could have like a more of a dialogue about you and your experiences or your thoughts or your feelings or your questions. And then maybe we can close with Don's and people can choose to watch it. And then at the end, so halfway through Don's take because he's so so interesting the way he talks and I I mean I love watching it but maybe other people won't at the end of it it's us performing together so I think you know people can choose what they want to do with their time and their focus um but that you know, so if you have any if anyone has any questions like a Q&A about you know reunion or our specific story or what I think about whatever you know I'd I, maybe we could open it up to Q&A now and then close with Don's take but yeah we should share that towards the end, if that's okay. cool. Okay, and I definitely, I'll start the questions off because the, the first question that I would like to ask is, when you met Don for the first time, mm -hmm. walk us through when you realized that you both had this musical connection. I mean, what sure. was that like for you? So. Well, so actually I discovered he was a musician before I met him because what happened was, is there was a dwelling, right? 
where, and I call it a dwelling because I don't want to semantically give anyone the impression of the word house because it really was not that. It would sort of be like a dwelling that may have been a house at one point that might have been taken over by hoarders and addicts. And there was, it was dark, broken up into several different areas surrounded by lots of trash, lots of animals and lots of intense environmental things. So that's one of the reasons Don always liked to be outside because for him, it was free of that. A lot of times um, the, the, the community that was in the dwelling, you know, they would pool together their SSI money or their food stamps and they sort of divided the space amongst themselves and the animals and the cockroaches and the rats and everything that was going on in the trash. So like Don, he really preferred to be kind of like in the alleyway on the side there when he would stop by conveniently to get whatever the mail was for him or, you know, whatever reasons he would be there. Otherwise he'd be like in the bushes somewhere, not like the tents you see, but like hidden in the bushes to be free in the world. So, um, so he wasn't actually at the dwelling the first two times I went, my birth uncle was there and, um, and I didn't yet know exactly. I kind of had an inkling from reading all the legal papers and he sort of looked a little bit like me as well. And he was sweeping the first day I got there. And um, yeah, can you, oh yes, I'll get to that. Thank you so much for asking that. Sure. Um, so anyways, I spent some time with my birth uncle first he like invited me into the dwelling once he, I asked actually, when I showed up, I was like, oh, so are, are you Don? And he was like, no, who wants to know? And then I was like, oh, then you must be Jimmy. I was like reciting like the legal papers, you know, oh, you must be my birth uncle, Jimmy. Or no, I didn't say that. I said, you must be Jimmy. And he goes, who wants to know? And I was, and that's when I was like, oh, I'm about to infiltrate their world and tell them that I'm the biological daughter of Don. And like, they don't know me yet. And I know enough about them having done research, but I should ask. You know, because it's about, I mean, I really, I remember like thinking, oh, I should ask. So I was like, well, would Don be open to willing to meeting another family member? And he was like, we know all of our family, like, who are you, blah, blah, blah. And then he was like, oh, wait a minute. And he looked at me and apparently I guess I have resemblance of, of my birth mother. And I actually feel like I look a lot like my birth uncle Jimmy more than Don in some regards, but like, we all kind of have this interesting genetic flair to each other. And I love that. I'm like, I'm so into that. I love like just meeting people and looking at them and collecting the possibility of all their genetic connections. And I just think it's so fun to, for me, that's fun. So, you know, and then, so Jimmy let me in. And so I found out that Don was a musician in the beginning through Jimmy. And it was so interesting because when I first walk in, he was like on the side run inside, but outside, but inside of the dwelling, it was dark. There was drapery and there was band posters of like Jimi Hendrix and black Sabbath and all up in the wall with cobwebs and the collections of CDs and tapes and like dirt everywhere. It was, it was really wild. And I just, you know, and I remember when he invited me in, I was like, Oh my God, either this is going to be the end of me <laughs> or this is going to be like the rebirth of me. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to go in. You know, I, I didn't bring anything with me, like an ID and a key. And that was it. And I was using the Metro and it was very street smart in the way that I approached the whole thing. And I went in and I spent time with Jimmy and I was like, it was like a world, a whole other world. And that's when he was telling me that they were musicians. And I was like, oh, wow, of course. And then he brought out the pictures because they had pictures. They had stacks of pictures and he would show me pictures. And I think what hit home for me the most was when he brought out a letter that Don had written from prison like a couple of years back. And, and I just, I read it and I could, I just, the tears came because I could see a person who was trying, you know, he, he, the, what he said, through the misspellings, the grammar, the struggle, the, the sentiment was there was a person who had compassion and a heart there. And, and I saw it in the writing. And, and then I was like, okay, this is, you know, this is so interesting. Like, is he a survivor of what now? And when I met him in all the five years I've known him, never once did he identify as a victim of anything. Never did he hold a grudge with anything. With If I had a bad day or if he remembered his mom, he always remembered his mom as, as his best friend before me. Uh, he even had these positive perspectives on all of the relationships he had with his dad and his brother. So I never did a shakedown to let Don even know of all the legal documentation of like how, how, how um, challenged his father was really documented. He knew, obviously he remembered like the red car and the mental hospital and how my, his father met my birth mother initially and brought her into the family. Like there's all these interesting details that everyone's scared of that I'm just like, eh, whatever it's their story. But um but with Don, it's just, he always had this, this element of compassion and willingness to forgive 
above and beyond. And I kind of feel that way about myself as well. So that was instantly something that I noticed. And then seeing him for the first time, that was just, I don't know, electrifying. And then I, and then he, he was so proud to show me they had broken guitars that he would fix or broken guitar pedals that he would fix. And, and so there was like this electric ele electrician -y savant in his mind as well. And he was so proud to show me these things. So in those first three weeks, there was a lot that I saw. I saw the, 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 I just saw the brilliance and how he solved anything and everything to survive. And his musicianship was self-taught and, and he was so great. I mean, he was just like this heavy metal electric crunch kind of rocker and, and, but he could also play a little blues. And he was one of the only, probably one of the only, I think, uh, they called them woods in, in prison, the white people that aren't part of the, the other crew of white. He was just this, just a very smart survivor in all the years he would go in and out for heroin, mostly or related, you know, dr drug situations or being in a place that was wrong or not having other than a, like a public defender, really not having you know, the privilege to kind of at least, you know, take a, take responsibility for specific crimes he did, he would just kind of get whatever, whatever was handed to him. And so he kind of learned that system and accepted it. And if he got caught, he told me, oh, well, I did so many other things when I didn't get caught that whatever, a couple of years getting a bed and food and be able to play guitar in prison and being a star. And like, he was one of the only guys that got to play with every race in there. And so it was really interesting to learn him and his perspective and his talent and he was so into the music uh, that I would share with him. He learned all my music and, and he even learned that I'm not religious, but I am, uh, I am a Jewish educator um, through my heritage, both my birth mother's lineage and my adoptive family are Jewish by, by um, ethnicity and culture. So I have taught in a lot of different Jewish settings with music as well as sort of like a bridge to self-identity in the Jewish customs and culture. And Don picked up a bass and just learned all that, not being Jewish, not even caring. It was music, it was anything to be with me. And from the very beginning, I started to position him in these volunteer settings where we, I brought him everywhere I did, I went. So like when I, when I worked with the uh, foster care and helped them learn how to write a song and record a studio with Don, I brought him in. I shadowed him as, a, as if he were a spectrum adult, which is neither here nor there because we didn't really use terminology like that. But I had enough experience working with those on the uh, autism spectrum or Asperger or high functioning adults with learning challenges that I picked up on things that worked with Don, the tools just worked and he just ate it up. And so whatever the definition was of his, you know, whatever it was that they, you know, somebody might classify him to be, to me, it was called the mental wellness spectrum. He wasn't a danger to himself. He wasn't a danger to me. He let me lead, he let me shadow, he let me advocate, he let me guide. And he was safe because we were together and that was the end of it and that was enough. And so the music I think was the biggest tie and volunteering and bringing him in at first. And he was a little shy, you know, I, the first year was a lot of just like putting him in the field, just sort of to pivot his self-defined, you know, his self-defined identity as this vagrant and then just to position it so that eventually it pivoted. So he became this volunteer and this like self-esteemed volunteer and a partner with me. I mean, that was the most thrilling part. Oh yeah, it resonates. Yeah, it was the most thrilling part of the whole bit. So yeah, the musicianship was amazing. His chess uh, skills were amazing. Um, his love for history was amazing. I remember when um, I was talking about maybe one day getting married and wanting to have a family one day, if I, if I ever can get around to finding a partner, you know, like that's com compatible. And, and, and he was like, oh yeah, you know, uh, and I was like, maybe one day I'll have twins. And he was like, that's so cool. And then he didn't really know. I was surprised that he wasn't really, he didn't really fully know how that happened. And I bought like a, a, a like a, a DNA how, where babies were born for adults, like book, like, and I shared it with, and I would buy him these books or get them donated. And, and I would watch, you know, from a distance and he would read them. And then he would write like what he, how he was, you know, understanding things as an adult. And it was, it was like, it was just so amazing to watch him. Cause in the five years he literally morphed and, and, and grew up, he grew up from this and so did I. And so, yes, yeah, so it was very powerful. It was really amazing. The music was super fun. It also validated me a little bit. Like I, I always was like, yeah, I'm a singer songwriter whatever. And then I started going to Nashville and wearing these cow boots 
you know, with hats and just loving that and just loving it there. And kind of always feeling like, oh my God, I'm a Jew from the Valley in LA. Like, is this even real? Is this even really fair? You know, can I do that? Am I just like playing a part? And then when I found Dawn and got to know our lineage, like we're English by Scotland and then they migrated over to Texas and to Tennessee. And they lived there before his dad, my birth grandfather made it to LA. So there were cowboy boots and it was real. And then, you know, and so that was really fun um, to have that piece. And to also sort of see like some of my struggles personality wise, like a little bit of my like impulsive fiery side when something just like overstimulates me. Like I watched Don and was able to shadow him and advocate for him to help him with like different sort of solution solving suggestions in the moment to help bring it down, you know, bring down whatever the big impact was. And, and then I could use it for myself. And so it was very, very fun. And at the very end, for most of you who may or may not realize he literally recently passed like tomorrow will be four months, um, which I think is also a good thing we can open up to talk about in a second too, is what do you do when you either when you found your birth family and then they pass away, how do you, how, how do you deal with that grief? How, and, and, or if you haven't found them yet and they aren't here, how do you deal with that? Because, you know, those are really important poignant self-identity questions for ourselves. Like what, what does it take for us to feel whole and what, what does it take for us to feel okay? And how do we develop those skills and that perspective if we even want to, because maybe we're not ready to do that. Maybe we're, we're more comfortable with being upset and feeling sad and feeling the loss because that, that is a piece that has to be trans tra transitioned through like that, that does have to be a part of our process. Um, and so, you know, I'm just pretty centered because well, a, I, my, my adopted dad, my dad passed away years ago and I was there and saw that. So I sort of knew the stages of death and how to sort of support Dawn through that. And also we knew Don wasn't gonna live forever and it was kind of part of our daily conversation and we prepared for it. And when he started to decline extremely fast from liver failure at the very end, we had like three weeks, two weeks, you know, to really kind of prepare and say our goodbyes and make our plans for spiritual world connection if that even exists, you know? And just, and I, ha I just had to accept like, you know, you just have to accept and, 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 and frame things and, and really narrate with self-love that like, hey, I got five great years and no matter how much I miss them every day and no matter how magnitude of that loss, like I have to make choices that are healthy and productive while I'm still here to help make the world a better place. And so that's kind of where we are today. And I don't wanna miss anyone's questions. And I think there was a really cool two of them. So let's see, can I, let's see, I'm gonna go to the chat for a minute and see. Yeah, this that is was so we, yeah, I think it was, let's see. Oh, excuse me, Lynn, uh, it was Lynn. Linda and Louise. Let's see, I'm, I'm gonna, yeah. oh, that resonates. My adoptive father was Jewish. So was my birth mom. And I wrote for Jewish magazines over the years. That's very cool. Um, and this one says, can you uh, expand on family difficulties with having you in the will? Oh, what was the outcome? What was, what, uh, was your mother needing to word the, okay, I can explain that, but I only can explain as much as I know, uh, which is not a lot. So I don't think my birth mother really was involved in the estate. It wasn't a will, it was a state plan, which is a little bit more formal. And um, whatever the language was at the time, and that was in the 60s or 70s that my birth grandmother had that outlined, I mean, obviously the language was pretty stellar because it stood the test of time until years later. So, um, but I think how it worked is whatever the estate plan was, how it was worded and drafted inclusive of whatever was left to my birth mother at the time of her death, whatever was remaining would then be passed down to her child, which was me. And I was written in there as my birth name, Cameron Morantz. And and my birth dates and all these things, but somehow, somehow they, the, I, the Jennifer Alpert piece was part of it. And I, that part, I don't really know um, exactly how that happened. Cause the Jennifer came, that name came to me later in foster care. And then the Alpert came at the end of the foster care when I was finally adopted by the Alpert. So there was like all this, these names and stuff, but my original identity, Cameron Morantz was in fact, the, the fact of me existing 
was drafted by my birth grandmother with an attorney specifically specifying that when my birth mother passes away, if there is anything left over that was hers, it would go to me. Even though I was a closed adoption and I was adopted out to the Alperts and all these things, it was there. And then when she passed away, there was, I guess, a lawyer from the estate in Denver, which is where the estate initially was drafted. Um, and then my grandparents moved to LA and had their life here with their children. That estate still still was sort of covering the umbrella of their livelihood, which, which the point again, isn't the money part. Cause it wasn't, I mean, it was a nice gift, gosh, really, but it wasn't about the fiscal piece. It was the point, right? So at, all I know is that the two lawyers, the, the, the Denver and the LA partnered together for this federal piece to ensure that um, whatever was left over ultimately did come to me. And they had to contact my mom, Jill, by the way, I call my mom who adopted me and raised me, Jill, my mom, my dad who adopted and raised me, Bill, even though he passed away, my dad. And I would call my birth mother, my birth mother. I never heard of the first, first mother till I met Jeanette Yoff from Celia Center. And I thought, oh, that's so cool. Like what an interesting thought there. But I just, I just called them my birth parents because that's what I figured they were. And then when I met Don, I was like, oh, he's an inventor. And, and he invented me. And I would call him the inventor of me. And he was so proud that his whole life, whatever he did and achieved and accomplished, I think he really felt proud that he actually made me. And I wanted to make him feel good about that. So every time he was with me on my birthday for the five years, I'd give him a present for inventing me and made it really big for him. Like you did this, you invented me. I'm an extension of you. And, uh, you know, and that, that, that's really, that was really fun uh, to be able to do that. So, but that's as much as I really know about the inheritance piece. I, I know that if you have, um, if you are a birth family member who wants to establish um, an estate plan with your birth child, though, though they're not with you anymore. I'm sure that there's an attorney that specializes in estates that can help with that and facilitate that because I know that it's possible that you can make that happen. You can make anything happen really now with legal language. So, um, and I guess if you really wanted to know more, I could always ask my mom and, and privately message you because that's, that's kind of as much as I know um, about that. Let's see, chat, chat, chat. Um, and this, this is so informative story for me. Dawn is so similar to a birth father. I'm befriending. Oh, that's wonderful. So glad. Yeah, you know, I mean, here's the thing. That's another thing I'll throw out there is to say, you know, whether it's your birth parents, children, friends, acquaintance, obviously anyone who's experiencing or choosing homelessness, there's a reason or a, a plethora of reasons not to be judged, but to understand. And there has to be a thoughtful approach when you're engaging with a different way of life. That doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It just means that there has to be an intelligent sort of thought out, non-codependent, present, interested way to learn about and understand and understand the scope. And if there's, I call it the mental wellness spectrum. And if there is something going on in the mental wellness spectrum there, that's not as high functioning, then we have to adjust our expectations and learn and understand and be present and just sort of gather what we can and, and, and generate whatever dynamic is possible. And it, same thing goes with addiction. I was very, very lucky with Don. He chose to use, and by the time I met him, he wasn't using heroin anymore. So the drugs that he was using, though they weren't great, they were a different animal. And he kind of was ready to, to just stop anyway. He was sort of tired, you know? And we weren't like AA absolutists. I mean, we went to AA meetings. I, I, I took him to a whole bunch for fun actually. And he was excited when I was there, he got to talk and he was really proud of that. You know, he was no longer scared of the whole like pressure of, you know, you should be saved by God or Jesus or whatever. Like for him, that didn't work for him. He felt uncomfortable with that. He wanted to just choose spiritually and he didn't have a reason otherwise. And he would tell me like, hey, if you had to be around the people I had to be around, like you do drugs too, believe me, drugs were great comparatively. And in a lot of ways, you know, yeah, they're, they're, uh, they're, they, they, I could understand and they were, let's see. So powerful to embrace the extended extension of family reunion success could be, yeah. You know, I mean, he, I, I, put, I put my daughter name unknown in my will years before I found her. That's very lovely. That's very lovely. I mean, that's a very special quality, you know, and, and sometimes we don't even really have 
fiscal things to pass down, but so what, maybe we want to pass down stories or connect and it's never too late. And what we're going to find, uh, and I did definitely want to make sure I don't over talk because I, I really do want you guys to hear some of the special things Don says in Don's take, but we should do a few more Q and a before that, but he, so, but before he passed away, I was like recording as many questions with him as possible. And I asked him in the car, I was like, listen, you know, uh, what would you say to an adoptee who's looking for their family or like is struggling? Or what would you say to a birth parent, you know, who like relinquished their child or were forced to? And he has really special, not everybody's going to like what he says, but he's also representing like the tone of a birth father. And he showed up, he showed up and he showed up and kept showing up and he wanted to be there. And, um, and I think that that's, it's special to know, even if our own stories are painful, and they're not resolved and they don't, they, or they might not be a positive, you know, a positive dynamic that it's no one person's fault when that's the case. And I really want to stress that I'm going to stress that for every person who's not choosing a voice to say it, no matter who you are, because the fact is, is that the emotional spectrum is so complicated and, and, and then how we are raised or what we were, are granted with the tools that we may or may not be introduced to, whoever we are, a birth mother, a birth father, an adopted child, a, a foster child, um, a, a per parent who wants to adopt for whatever reasons, you know, I mean, there's so many poignant pieces to the constellation and everyone has the best that they have. And sometimes there's just, they're just not able to handle the pain or, or, or whatever the perspective is, or, or the reality, or their reality, or other people's realities, and that's no one's fault, not even the person who's struggling, you know, and I think that that piece of compassion, I think if every person could, would be willing to consider this piece of compassion for their own little child within themselves, and to open their self to see what, what someone else is showing up at the table, or what they can't show up, why they can't, maybe they have a new family. They didn't tell you about the child that they had to give up, or maybe they, they, they hold on to uh, the, 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 the judgment and the pain of whatever their story was. And they can't tell you, or maybe there was more trauma attached. And so the, all of those pieces, I think are so important to honor that, you know, at least that's how I feel about it. I never felt any criticism of my birth mother. I didn't even really feel like this huge loss when I didn't get a chance to meet her because she passed away first. I, I, I really, I didn't even feel, I don't know. I never really felt that, but I definitely felt this empty hole until I found Don and he filled it for me forever. He really did. And, and it's forever a, a gift. And I am so grateful for that. And so anyway, let's see, I feel like you were careful to add, oh yes. Okay, so um, lovely, lovely. I'm so glad, the, oh, should I, do I have to repeat the question or do you guys read those chats? Should I repeat? I, I, I like that you were careful to add that you were with him non-codependently. Did you ever have to set and force boundaries as many of us do when dealing with an addictive personality? Okay, I, will, I wanna say, first of all, semantics have always been my favorite thing. So when it comes to boundaries, I use the word parameters, especially with Don, because I never wanted there to be an element of no, you can't. I always want there to be a, yes, this is the option. Yes, this is what's available to us. Yes, these are the choices we can make in this situation. Which one do you want? And so um, I think a boundary it, for me is instilled within my inner core for myself so that I know how to keep myself in check in the universe. But remember, well, you don't know this, but I studied a lot. I mean, I worked really, really hard for years because I was in relationships with addicts I didn't even understand when I was younger or the codependent things. And I didn't even know what that was. So really by the time I got to Don, it didn't matter what he was gonna dish out, which luckily for me, he was super cool. But if he hadn't been, it wouldn't have mattered. So I would have been like, yo, this is the parameter. If you're going to break it, you're going to lose it. It's no big deal. I, I mean, I had the stability, but I built that. If it had been 10 years, 20 years before, it might've been different. And we kind of both acknowledged that. Um, but yeah, so, so, and Don 
also, I have to say, and this is not in this version of Don's take, but there's a longer version on, on YouTube, on my YouTube, that's like so long that who would want to watch it? But maybe for that person, who was that, that thoughtful person who asked, it's, um, it's, um, is that Michelle? Okay. So, um, you might want to watch because there's another piece to Don's take where he talks about addiction and he talks about like the different types of addiction. I, I personally have always sort of had this concept of each individual person has a relationship to and put in the blank to addiction. What kind of addiction is it? Is it heroin? Is it alcohol? Is it, is it depressed, depressed feelings, chasing the drama? Is it the addiction to the AA meetings when we don't resolve to the next platform? Is it, is it uh, the addiction to food? Is it the addiction to whatever it is? So with Don, I observed him for a while as I let him in. And that was a choice that I made from like kind of having, I don't know, tool, tools. And, and it was fun for me because I wasn't really worried about it. I didn't have like a whole future picture. The future just unfolded and it was the best actual experience of my life because it was the first time in my life that life really just got to unfold and I got to use all my tools and my skills and my intellect and my confidence and trial and error and and that was just so thrilling and if life could always be that way and forever that way I mean wow it's, it's just like that's great I tell you um but uh I think the codependent thing is a, is a practice and it's much easier to practice that without somebody that you're so worried about hurting themselves or losing whatever it is that you imagine you want to have. When I met Don, I was like, oh, you shoot up? Cool, well, don't hide it. I need to know when you're getting high and when you're not. Please don't hide it. You wanna shoot up, shoot, shoot up, go ahead. And then he really didn't like that. It, it, for some reason, the reverse psychology for him, he stopped, but I didn't say you must stop. I mean, he, he chose to do a lot of things because I stayed in the field with him for so many days. It was dangerous. And he was worried about me. He liked me, you know, and I think that was, that was the thing like, you know, but that, but he told me himself and I know it true. And so for, it depends on the kind of addiction you're talking about because an alcoholic who's constantly drinking and they're more drunk and addicted with the withdrawals than they are sober. That's a different dynamic. And that's going to be difficult. You know, Don was a happy high, you know, he was a happy go lucky high dude already. So he did, he was, he, and, and, and he was really using it from the age nine to escape everything and to uplift his sadness. And he knew that about himself and that was his choice. So it's, you know, and then when he did heroin, that was another thing. I never got to see that. Luckily he told me if, if I had found him while he was doing heroin, it wouldn't have mattered who I was. It, it, heroin would have always taken precedence. And so, you know, I, I don't know. There was one day I'll, I'll tell you that there was a codependent moment and it, it happened because it was about, let's see, there was a three weeks into the field with Don when I went under, I call it undercover in the field. Then he decided to turn himself in. He had to do like 90 days. And so I wrote him like three letters a day and sent them in, in like these big envelopes. We had something to do while he was there. And I borrowed an address because he never knew where I lived for a long time. I blindfolded him when I assimilated him indoors to let him like get, take a shower to kind of get to know him or to see if he could cook or how he would do things or whatever. And he was so excited to share with me. We had an agreement that if he was going to come into my world, he was going to be blindfolded. So he couldn't just come and go. And like, that's very, who's going to do that? Who's going to say yes to that? But Don was like, okay, cool, whatever. So I blindfolded him and like would drive different directions. And he didn't, he couldn't come and go for a very long time. And he never actually did come and go. So you also have to take into the account that like, there must be some sort of spectrum savant kind of piece to this because he never really did anything, you know, to, to, to shake the ground ever. He just kind of let me lead. And that's very, and it wasn't a codependent thing. He actually truly respected me and valued me. And I just was, had so much energy and ideas and everything that what's that? She's looking at the phone. Is that the time? Is that time? Oh, okay. Time. All right. Sorry. So we'll close it up. So anyways, yes, the codependent thing, you just kind of got to work on it. And, uh, and, and um, I don't know what else to really say about that to sum it up. Our situation was very unique. Um, so yes, you do have to have boundaries, but I think the best thing I can leave you with with that topic is each situation is so unique and different. And if you can hold on to your own ground and figure out the parameter and a language that resonates with another person and find a way to be okay, 
you just got it. I mean, because there was this one day where he did escape. <laughs> like there was a couple months into it. He did. He like he I, at first there was a sober living home that we kind of put him in to try it out near me. I because I, I, he didn't like to start living with me right away. It wasn't even like that. And, uh, and I would pick them up every morning and then drop them off right when they would lock the door. And, you know, it, it included like an AA meeting. And we kind of did that for the court so that he had like an address at first. And, and it was so scary, actually. It was like so reminiscent of his other like situations that he ran away one day and ended up like you get getting a drink. And he ended up actually sleeping outside of the dwelling. I looked everywhere for like hours. And when I finally found him, at, you know, at first I was like, nice, like, oh, I'm so, you know, you got to choose. Do you want to keep doing this? Or would you like to come back? We can start over. Like we'll start, we'll press restart here because, because you're on AB 109, you're on probation. If you get caught doing anything, you could be in the wrong place, the wrong time coughing and you'll go back to jail and it could be forever because who knows what they'll say you did. Like you got to choose. And so he chose to come in my car and like, you know, and, 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 and we, and I, and I told him like, look, you, you like weed, you like medical marijuana, your probation officer said you're allowed to have it. Well, I will buy it. We will measure it out for anxiety. And, and you, this is as much as you can have every day. Oh, you want your cigarillos? All right. Well, you know, I don't want cancer. So here's where you got to smoke it. You got to have an ashtray. You got to pick up those cigarette butts. You can't just leave this around and it can't be cigarettes and you get two a day. Is that cool? Okay, cool. Oh, you want a drink of alcohol? Well, here's the deal. Every one of my alcohol bottles, it's tea. You're never going to find alcohol in my house. They're going to look pretty. You try to taste, it's going to taste like shit. But if you want something, well, we can do a nightcap and I will measure it. And if you like that, and if that's enough for you and you don't go crazy and start drinking up a bottle, we'll test it out. We'll see where the parameter is. And for Don, it worked. I don't know why, you know, and that wasn't a codependent thing. If he decided to do something else, I was ready to let him walk anytime, even though I didn't want it because I loved him so much and he was so fun. Like we were choosing to love each other and, but he chose it. And it was this very symbiotic thing with both of us. So, you know, I, I can talk to you more about that if you want to like private me message that, but that's the best I have there. After you answer, we need to go ahead and show the video. Oh, what, oh so yeah, so that was it. So if anyone has any more questions, um, I'd love to talk forever. And, I, and, and, and I'd love to hear about all of you. Like really, honestly, I think it would be fun to open up at some point and hear, you know, your stories or if you have more questions or you can write me on Facebook or whatever you want but the first 10 minutes of Don's take that we'll show you now they're the best 10 minutes he's so great and then as it goes on if you want to leave or if you want to write me more questions I can write you whatever you want and thanks for having me I, mean, I think it's so cool there's so many of you here and I, I mean I just thanks for letting me be here and thanks for caring and yeah well we'll keep, we'll keep everybody will stay on through I'm, I'm sure through the the video and we always have closing comments and we have oh. a, a little giveaway so let's yeah Okay, we'll see what happens. Well, thanks for letting me jabber on because I can talk You're forever. You're fine. You're fine. Okay, Jen. Okay, so you'll just share the screen. Oh, look, there it is. Oh, wow. Hi, Don. Hey. Get off. Suddenly, I'm naked again in the very same room as my child. Only now I'm sitting beside the edge Cage blankets, innocent wild Denying voice, hidden there all the while Only now I'm not so far from there Something
45 years. I never had a house. All, even since I was a little boy, I used to run away and go live in the bushes. That was my regular thing. I've always been homeless. The very first time since I've been on this planet that I'm not homeless is with her. Other than that, I would automatically run away and go live homeless because I didn't want to deal with the cops, the parole officer, the probation officer, so I would just run. And I'm scouting until they catch me. And then do the time and get out and scound again. I never really understood freedom like this. It's a different life. I, uh, I don't have any keys I could offer the homeless people that you can have a different life. But what I'm just bringing to your attention is it can be done. You would have to want to do it, if that's what you want. Homelessness and having a house is within reach. You can choose. If you need to hook up with a friend or a family member, I would advise to do it. Get Learn to get along with them if you have to. Quit doing the heroin and cocaine if you have to, like I did. I mean, you know, be real about it. Yeah. Do you have any other kids you look forward to? No, I have no other children in this life at all. I did that with Mary Lou and then went right to jail. Nine months later, Mary Lou gave birth to her and she went to Metropolitan State Hospital, so California put her in the adoption agency. Meanwhile, she was in foster homes. See? She never actually was raised by us. So when I found her, I didn't know what to think, you know? I didn't know what kind of life that she understood and what she her, her way of life and wants and desires and so on and so forth. So certainly with the opportunity, I got a chance to get to my daughter. That's exactly what I did.
Don't you lie for me I will lie for you One of these days and it won't be long All of these shadows, oh, they'll be For people that uh, were adopted and think that they were just dropped off and left out and nobody loved them and just kicked out of the family's life, well, look at it this way. What if the family just ran out of supplies and really couldn't take care of you? Well, then in that case, you're going to be ad adopted somewhere, so mm -hmm. what the hell are you going to do about it? Mm -hmm. Somebody's going to raise you. What damn difference does it make who it is? And maybe they got, you said, the better end of the stick or something? Yeah, being that they were adopted out might have helped them out as the better end rather than the family trying to keep when they can't be kept. Like in my case, I went to, I went to jail. I had no way to raise you, but I at least knew that. That's why I wasn't sitting in jail heartbroken about it. I knew I wasn't going to be able to raise you. If the parents run out of supplies or get in trouble or come up with no way they can care for the kid, then the smartest thing they can do is to search out adoption agencies to try to help their kid get into the best adoption they can and meet up with them later in years once they're an adult. So you don't got to worry about trying to raise them. What would you want adoptees to, to know or to think or to feel if they're really sad and upset and feel like they didn't get to meet their family or they didn't get to be raised by their family? I would tell them to search out why. Because it's no doubt a different reason than they think. A lot of them, the girl ended up uh, turning the pleasure of sex into a pregnancy that she had not one grain of sand in her brain what's going to happen and pop up pregnant and don't have a clue what she's going to do with it. So they automatically just leave them in an adoption or, or some kind of an agency because they can't do anything else. They didn't even mean to get pregnant. Yeah. I got to deal with that problem. Mm -hmm. Or men sometimes don't even... Yeah, they find out their chick popped up pregnant, they split on them. What made you want to meet me, stay with me? Because my mind was made up before I did that with Mary Lou. That's exactly how I wanted it to untangle, run into you 30 years later and see how you fared in life. See how the people... I was lucky. You got raised by some pretty out-of-sight people. I mean, I maybe they weren't lucky got adopted by somebody that didn't even like them and treat them like shit. I mean, anything could happen. But I'll tell you what, if you're ever going to be independent, you're going to have to not give a fuck about all that. I got here, that's all I give a fuck about. <laughs> I'll take over the steering wheel for myself from here. Thank you for everything you did and didn't do and all that. No hard feelings. I'm gone. That's it. So when I showed up that day, 2016, you weren't really surprised? None. None, none at all. I had been waiting for that to happen. <laughs> and so that's exactly what the reality was. That when she was adopted out, I wasn't surprised at all. I knew that was coming. I was grateful when I found out that she was adopted out by a prominent family that took real good care of her, all the more grateful when 2016 came around and I finally ran into her and was able to meet her and, and learn the details of her upbringing. The Alberts out didn't, for one thing. I couldn't have brought her up as good as the Alberts did. Running around on drugs and running from law and all that, how, how could I have been a, a solid father? There was no way that was going to work. So when she was adopted, that was just part of the plan. I didn't feel like my daughter was ripped off out of my hands at all. It was, I knew from the beginning that I wasn't going to be there for her, before I even had the sex. 
So I wasn't hurt about that my daughter was taken from me. I was grateful, as crazy as that may sound. I knew I couldn't raise her, but someone else would do this for me, rather than to just leave her in the gutter until she dies. Because I wasn't there, man. I wasn't there. There was nothing I could do. So when, uh, when the years went by and I ran into her, I was grateful. Why did I miss you? Now I'm caught in memories of you. Heaven is a place I'm running from. Don't know what's real. Don't think I'll heal. Don't wanna do what I should. Heaven is a place I'm running from. Don't know what's real. to be good
Okay, so we're back, right? We are back. And let's check out the time. Boy, that was fascinating. Great job. It was just such a wonderful story. And uh, the way you're, you're honoring your, your uh, father and your, your relationship, your reunion, it's just beautiful. Thank you so much. Okay, we can't hear you again. You're on mute. Got it, got it. Thank you so much for having me. I really wanted to um, pause that just to let you guys know, since we are recording, I wanted to answer the one question I'm gonna, I'm gonna read it out loud because it's such a hot question. And I just think it's so important to share it. And we are gonna be at the edge of time with the answer, but at the very end of that video is Don's last performance at the Grand Canyon when he was quite ill. And he was sad about, having to leave this world. And I just said, life is grand. You're still alive. We're going to the Grand Canyon. We're going to play your concert. I took all of our instruments with this, like this, this uh, what is called this battery generator and, and we played. So, I mean, if, if you don't mind maybe unpausing at the very end, just for that as a closing, if anyone wants to stay. But I, 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 I just, I love this question so much in the chat. I want to, oh, thank you. You guys are so kind. Thanks for having me. So I'm going to read this uh, question uh, where, because it's so awesome. And, uh, and I just, I love when things are so hard. <laughs> so she goes, hi, Cami. I haven't shared this with anyone. So you can choose whether to answer. It looks like you and your father, birth father, got very close. And while you had clear boundaries or parameters, I wondered if either of you experienced genetic attraction or genetic sexual attraction. If yes, how did you handle that? And did you have prior knowledge it could occur? And feel free to ignore this. <laughs> I love the question. Um, I'm so glad you asked because it's a great question. Now, I'm going to preface this by saying I am so unstigmaed by everything. I'm just a very, I'm an octagon, not even like out of the box. I'm just an octagon. So I'm something way different. So that's the preface. That's just the disclaimer here. Um, so that's number one. Um, no, I didn't know about the genetic sexual attraction before, but I didn't need the lingo or the definition or the language to recognize right away when I saw Don that I loved him instantly. And I already knew the history of my, 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 my coming here was so out of the box. My birth mother was years younger than Don's dad and she was technically his girlfriend that they met in a mental hospital. He pulled her out and then brought her to the family and everyone shared. 
And that was like above and beyond the 60s and 70s. I mean, they were just, they were just out of the box completely anyway. Um, and there was a lot of shame and an upset and embarrassment with that. And then the fact that my birth mother was like over 15 years older than Don. Don was 16 at the time that she gifted, at the time that he gifted her her request to have a baby because he didn't have a vasectomy so he could do it. And he was like, yeah, cool, whatever. Like he, he was, I don't even think it was like, I mean, why wouldn't, why would anybody be like, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to have sex. No. I mean, like, what? Come on. You know, and I would joke with Don. I was like, oh, we shouldn't feel bad about it. Like whatever. Yeah. It's, it's different. Right. It's not traditional. Oh, well, you know, and, and, and so he talks about that and I knew it right away from the court case, even before I met him and, and all that. So I mean, who, like, if we're going to talk about victims and abuse here, who, who is, who, who really, like, is that really, like, we don't even know the answer to that really, because later Don was like, well, she wasn't fully, um, always processing the reality of things. I mean, yes, she welcomed the sexuality we're talking about her birth mother for a minute here. And I'm going to go into why I'm going to skip to your answer in a sec, your question to answer that in a second. But the point is, is that, um, you know, she was aware and willing but also not fully present. And she was younger in her energy based on trauma, the traumatic thing that happened to her before. So she bonded well with Don and they didn't really, it wasn't the same way of framing things in the, in the, anyways, they were just like, let's, you know, make a kid or whatever. Like, so there was, and they were, and he was young and he was, he was, I mean, technically it would have been sagittory because he was younger than her. And when the court case came out, he took the rap and said it was his idea and then got thrown in the hole. When he was already serving time for like stealing a car and doing drugs and and and, and it, it really was a mutual thing it wasn't actually you know rape it wasn't so but you know again i wasn't there i mean i was there later but i wasn't actually there in the moment so who knows there's like 50 perspectives to every story and so that's their story but because that was already out of the box i'm gonna come out as an octagon right and i'm like whatever you know whatever and i'm, I'm not conservative i was raised very thoughtful in a Jewish world. And like, I I've never been promiscuous. I actually never really done drugs. Mo most, many of them. I was usually like the drug everyone wanted to get rid of. Cause I was like, I'm not leaving. Right. But I was like the one everyone was like, Oh my God, it's too much. Right. Um, so, so I kind of always joke about that, but, um, when it came to the sexual attraction with Don, so when I first saw him, well, first of all, he was kind of a conglomeration of a lot of dudes I was interested in all my life. And I thought that was so trippy. Like, yeah, he pulled out his teeth. So that part, probably not, but it wasn't about the physicality. It was this energetic connection and it was a chemical chemistry. And, it, and then it grew into something more in terms of loving one another. Um, but the sexual piece that did happen to transpire an interest, like within two weeks of knowing each other, the thing about it is, is that it wasn't that I didn't act on it because I was religious or because it was a shameful idea. Man, I would have married him. I would have married him. I loved him. Like he was the best man ever in my life. I didn't act on the sexuality because I wanted to protect Don. A, because he'd been in prison always. And actually it's illegal. Even though we were legally severed, there's a piece that's illegal. And I didn't ever want to put Don in a position emotionally or in a, a criminally or any way that wasn't loving and thoughtful for his best interest. Would he have cared? No. Oh my God. If I'd been like, yo, let's get down. He would have totally done it. And I would have done it. And because we loved each other like that, but there's an intellectual piece in making a decision. And I was really proud of the decision that I made to honor the fact that that's a genetic line that you don't cross because we're educated to do that. And let me just tell you that when I found out that our bloodline was like English, I'm like, oh, that's what, when people don't like me, it's because I was English. I have an English lineage, took, put my flag everywhere and took over. And back then kings and queens did everybody, brothers, sisters, whatever. In fact, it's because of us that we have the rules, don't you know? I mean, so that's kind of like how I see it, you know? And it's like, you know, incest is scary if you don't want it. And it's scary because there's stigma and, and you're not really supposed to be with your parents, but he didn't raise me. And he was way younger than, I don't know. So I guess I'm open about it because I think it's important to kind of lighten up. 
and like laugh about it. I mean, man, I could be, I'm attracted to my dog sometimes. My dog is so cool. It comes up to me and tries to lick at my mouth. And I'm like, Rockius, <laughs> there's boundaries here. There's a line, I'm, I'm not a dog, you know? But they like, and so, and I watch my animals, my cats, my dogs, they do each other all the time. And I'm like, this is so crazy. Like what's happening? So if we're really going to that primal place outside of the primal wound, but the primal heart, I think we just all wanna love each other and love ourselves and love, love, love. And why not have pleasure? I mean, everything could be pleasure. And if everything is so terrible and such a stigma and so awful, I mean, there's laws and parameters and boundaries for a lot of reasons. People can't handle all sorts of things and, 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 and really for health and, and, and for wellness and, and, and for structure and for society, whatever. But Don and I literally chose to honor society and to honor, and I, and because I, I think that Don would have just not cared. And like, I didn't really care sometimes either. And in the very beginning, I was like, oh, dude, wow, this is crazy. I mean, like, I love this guy. Like, I, I mean, you know, and, and so, yes, it was a conscious understanding of what it was. I did look it up. There's a couple of articles of actually about a birth daughter who finds her birth father later in life and they actually do get married and have kids. And I don't understand how that happened and how legally it was possible, but it happened. And, and so there are stories of that. So I learned about it a little bit later, like how to put a, a title to what happened. But I love the question because I think everyone is each to their own. And, you know, I mean, what happens behind a closed door between two consenting adults is private. And if, if, if you're going to like check something out because you want to express yourself and you can handle it, that's not my business. But make sure that you really know what you're doing and that you can handle it. Because the thing is that I wanted to be a stellar, stable, loving person with Don. And I wanted to make sure. And he also had so many people really disappoint him that we didn't need to touch each other for there to be a sexual satisfaction. There was love. There was love every day. I made sure he knew it every day, even on my worst day, which there was a few, you know, and like, and, 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 and I, and that was so healing in and of itself. So yeah, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't go out there and like parade cross that line. Probably not, but, but it's okay to recognize that it's there. If you haven't been with somebody your whole life, I mean, it's a trip. It's a trip. And, and, and there's other adoptees who came to me privately later who talked about their, like a male friend of mine who was adopted when he found his birth mother, he said he felt like, and we're very candid. So we have our lingo. And he was like, yeah, I would have totally tapped that. You know? And like, he didn't. And I was like, it's probably better you didn't because you never know what's going to happen after, you know, or sisters or whatever. Um, so I like to be open about it and, and it might disgust people. I mean, people who are religious and raised with God and, and Jesus specifically, and there's rules there. I mean, in the Orthodox Jew world too, there's rules that aren't, are there for a reason. And then you look in the Torah and you're like, Hey, but, but Abraham, I mean, he had 18 concubines and like, what are you talking about? He probably had a sister and a wife and who knows. But so I guess I just, I, I lighten it up a little bit because it's going to happen. You're going to be attracted. You're going to love them. And there's lots of ways to be able to express that. And you can talk about it and laugh about it and open and make it open instead of it being terrible and so shameful and so horrible, you know, but Don and I were so on the same page. We were cut from the same cloth above and beyond anything I've ever imagined in my life. I mean, if I was weird to begin with, and I use that term lightly and fun, like we were like literally weird together and it was amazing. And that, and I think that's the, that's the best part about our love story is that it was okay to be different. And we loved that. And, 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 and my favorite, and when we, and I got him teeth, you know, like UCLA was like the first person to identify as homeless that the, the UCLA dental program allowed to come get free dentures. We did this whole like 10 week program and he, and he put the dentures in his pocket after that. He never wore them. You know, he didn't even want, he was like, oh, they're so nice. You know, I don't want to like ruin them. I'll, I'll put them in like to smile for like when I'm gambling or whatever. I mean, it was just so funny. And, and I didn't even like the dentures so much. I just liked him exactly how he was, no matter what stigma people put on to him because some people did you know they judged it you know they judged him when he didn't look all clean cut but I don't care I loved it anyway I could I have enough smiley teeth and my mom helped me with braces and headgear to cover teeth for both of us like who cares you know so anyway that's my answer and I, I don't want to take up any more time if you have any other questions um but I love that question oh thank you enlightening oh thank you thank you that's really nice no, that, that was a that was a great answer um yeah we could do a whole happy hour on GSA I mean, oh, the whole, yeah. the whole episode, which we might do that in the future. But uh, once again, I mean, we're, Cammy, we're just happy, excited that you were here with us tonight and to share your journey, uh, you and Don. We're so <laughs> sorry for your loss. Um, 
but what an incredible gift you gave him. What an incredible five years the two of you had together. Yeah. Yeah. So it was just, it was just phenomenal. And we want to thank you again. Well, thank I'd you. love to come, I'll come anytime, but it, you know, you got to, the, the real boundary has to be with me, you know, like cut her off and Don is the best. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, want you to, we want you to hang around for just a little bit because we've got just a couple of a few announcements before we close and then Jennifer went ahead and put some links and I know you did too in the chat room for those of you that, that want to follow up with Cammie uh, we can, we'll, can probably have her back on in the new year as well but it was just it was just really nice we just had a really great time and thank you so much for sharing sure so um Jennifer and I've got a couple of little announcements we want to make. First of all, we, we mentioned last week that we wanted to have just a little, little, you know, it's tis the season and we're going to just do a little giveaway. So uh, we drew names out tonight and we're just, you know, in the spirit of uh, the season of giving, we're just going to, we just pulled out one winner for a $20 Amazon gift card. So you can buy your friend a Starbucks or buy yourself a book or whatever you want to do with it. But um i let's see and the wind we're going to go ahead and announce that right now and the winner is charlotte smith Woo! charlotte <laughs> wave at us take yourself off mute Woo! oh thank you so much. you've got 20 bucks from amazon coming i'm so yeah. excited thank you well you're quite welcome now what where are you from melbourne australia 33 degrees here right now oh, melbourne australia Okay. Fights? Are you getting some good <laughs> fights? <laughs> I think, yeah, we can do that online. I don't think there's a problem with that. So uh, we've got your email address, I assume, Jennifer. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. So we will we'll, uh, we'll get we'll be getting back with you on that. So congratulations, Charlotte. You're Thank you so much, and happy holidays, everyone. Happy holidays to you too. Thank you for joining us tonight. You come back, okay? Okay. Well, it's been a while since I, I've been able to attend, but I'll be back. Great. Thank you. Okay, Jennifer, what's next? Um, we'll talk about uh, the two other programs we've got coming up, our holiday announcement, and then we'll finish this video. Okay. So uh, on Tuesday, December 28th at 8.30 Eastern Standard Time, we have Adoptee Paths to Recovery. Uh, with David Bowl, and we hope you'll join us this Tuesday. And then we also on the same day. And we also on that same evening before David's, we also have Dr. Joyce putting herself together after reunion. Joyce will be closing out with some tips and we do have a, a special guest that will be joining Joyce as well. So you'll want to uh, register on Eventbrite to attend uh, if, you can, if you'd like to, both of them on Tuesday evening. <clears throat> and then just our announcement for the new year. Yes, we just want to make a little announcement about for the next two Fridays, we will be uh, enjoying the holidays with our family. So there will be no happy hour. However, we will be back on uh, Friday, January the 7th with a mystery plural guests. We're going to have multiple guests on January the 7th. So you want to mark your calendars, calendars and start off the new year with us on Friday night. So we really appreciate you, uh, you coming back. I also, in closing, would like to say I wish each and every one of you um, a happy holiday season. Stay safe uh, with your families, making wonderful memories. I know we always try to, you know, we have family traditions every year and be good to yourselves as well. And um, when you think about uh, happy hour, I just wanted to mention that, you know, we're closing out another year. How many episodes now? 46. We had 46 episodes now, I think, for the 46 year. 46 episodes this year. We couldn't have done it without our amazing guests and our amazing attendees. And as long as we have an audience, we will still be here every Friday evening, uh, bringing you entertainment, education, connections, and we know a lot of healing takes place on these happy hours. So thank you for that. And many of you, um, I know our year end appeal letter went out and many of you have already reached out to us. Uh, we thank you for that. It's be again, because of all of your continued support, NAP can continue to offer these programs. So 
Uh, thank you so much for your gifts and keep us in mind. And like I said, mark those calendars and we'll plan on seeing you January 7th. If you haven't already, visit us on our Facebook page, the National Association of Adoptees and Parents. And we do have a special happy hour page as well. Uh, we can continue conversations after that point uh, as well. That's all for me. All Thanks right, so you ready to resume the video? Yeah, I think so. I, I love you guys. I love this. I love, I love it. I love what you're doing. You're serving the community. I, I, I'm just so touched that everyone's here. What a wonderful group of people. And yeah, we'll, I guess we'll end with the rest of the video of Don's final performance on this planet, but he's here in spirit. I just know it. So um, thank you so much for including me. You're welcome, Cammie. Thank you. Yeah, I'll mute and we'll screen share. Hang on a second. It didn't look right on my end. Let me try that again. Well, it just takes a second to render, but it was awesome. It's fine. Okay. I wasn't what I it wasn't looking right to me. So here, let's go again here.
Thank you, guys. That was Ruckus and Roof, by the way, barking. I hope they didn't bark too much. Sorry. <laughs> but anyway, okay. thanks. That was wonderful. So wonderful. Healthy holidays to everybody. Good night. Happy holidays, everybody. Be safe. <laughs>